First of all, I'll, I'll um, briefly introduce how I got interested in this um, question of Ockham's razor and, uh, and William of Ockham himself. Um, it actually arose because um, a talk at my institute at the University of Surrey by a colleague and a friend, Hans Westerhoff, who's one of the founders of the um, science of systems biology. Both, of our, both uh, uh, Hans and I work in this area, which is about um, um, using models, mathematical models, of biological systems to predict how they're going to behave. Um, Hans gave a talk about a decade ago, uh, which was entitled um, No Occam's Razor for Systems Biology. And this was a decade ago. I was vaguely aware of Occam's Razor. It was a principle of simplicity that you should choose the simplest solution, but I knew very little else about it. But I did know that I passed a village of Ockham on my drive into work along the A3. And um, that prompted me to think, OK, well, I have to find out a little bit more of this to see if there was a connection. And there was. Uh, um, William of Ockham was born in the Surrey village, which made me think, oh, to try to rush to the defence of, um, of William and his razor. So I found out a little bit more about William of Ockham and his razor. And the more I found out, the more intrigued I became. And it provoked me to um, write this book. So it's... Um, Tell you first a little bit about William of Ockham, a Franciscan friar born in the village of Ockham, um, not far from uh, Guildford, where I work. Uh, it's a pretty little village, quiet village. This uh, on the left is a portrait of uh, William of Ockham um, later in his life. Um, and he's most famous for, um, oh, and uh, on, the bottom, on the bottom right, you can see where Ockham is, um, just south of London and in Guildford. And... Um, William of Ockham is famous for entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity, which is Ockham's razor. And, uh, but there's a lot more to William of Ockham than his razor, as I found out. So when Hans gave his talk and made this case for, um, for Ockham's razor not being um, appropriate in biology generally, really, because he claimed biology was irreducibly complex. In other words, you shouldn't try to simplify it at all. Um, so I thought I'd find out a little bit more. And that's taken me uh, most of 10 years to dig out um, um, what I needed to know. So a little bit more about William. He was um, he studied theologies of little, we know very little of his origin. He doesn't, um, we don't know who his parents are. So they're probably fairly um, unremarkable. Um, it's often... Um, the sons or uh, sons of um, nobles were given to the Franciscan order. Um, but because we don't know his family, that probably didn't happen to him. To him, he uh, may have been an orphan or a, um, a foundling, a, uh, a child left on the doors of the, um, of the friary. Anyway, we don't know much about his early education, but we do know he was sent to study theology at Oxford um, around 1320. And theology at the time, this is why this is of interest, I think, to, um, to the Royal Institute and people who are interested in science, theology at that time was known as the queen of sciences. And I want to little, explore that a little, why and how it could be called the queen of sciences. For a start, they studied a rather broad range of topics in theology. Um, the standard textbook was something called Lombard Sentences, and it uh, had a lot of questions and answers by the great church fathers. And these were the kind of questions that they, um, that they examined. In what manner is free will accepted in God? So this is, this is, these were stupid people, the medievals. They were worrying about deep issues that we still worry about, free will. What is free will? Um, we can't decide on, and we haven't agreed on that today. So um, another question, whether it would be fitting that God would ass that God assume the womanly gender. So gender politics was also, also something that was discussed in relation to theology. But then there comes questions that are kind of sticking a toe, at least in science, whether the angels were composed of matter and form. This was the Aristotle idea that everything was composed of matter and form. And did the angels also 
um, uh, were they made of the same materials rock, uh, as rocks and stones and, uh, and people? Whether the firmament is the same as the element of fire. Firmament is, of course, the sky. And the sky, of course, plays a huge role in the early development of science. So we'll, so we'll take a look at it and, um, and ask you to think from, uh, here's um, a, a beautiful uh, a picture of the night sky and you can see all the stars and a few shooting stars uh, going by. Um, and the first question, just consider for a moment, you can't answer the question in this talk. Normally, if it's a live talk, I'll ask, who, can, who knows? How you tell the difference between stars and planets? That's one question you want to, uh, I want you to think about. Many of you will probably know the answer. And then the second question um, I want you to think about is how, what happens to stars when you're not looking at them? So in other words, if you leave stars alone and, and don't uh, um, look at them, what do they do? Um, where are, do they stay in the same place? Do they move? So we'll answer the first question. Um, for, uh, the second question first. Um, it's a question that wouldn't have occurred to anyone in the medieval world because they saw this every day. They saw what was happening to the stars every day because at night it was so dark they could see the stars. In the summer they often slept outside. So they knew what the stars do every day. They rotate in perfect circles around the North Star. So that's the first thing that if you were wanting to found a science um, you might want to account for. What is it that makes the stars rotate in perfect circles? So that's uh, our question. And what the answer that came, they came up with, actually the ancient Greeks came up with, is that they attach these stars to a crystal sphere. So here's a plan of the medieval um, universe, um, which is basically inherited mostly from the ancient Greeks. And you can see at the center, the, um, the uh, sphere at the center is the earth and beneath the earth was hell. So although we call it a, a geocentric universe, it's actually a Diablo-centric universe with hell at its center. And beyond the earth was the moon and the sun. You can see the um, sun sign on, on, so the rings of crystals are crystal spheres. Why they had to be crystal? Because you couldn't see them in the sky, so they must be transparent. So they reckon they were made of crystal. And, um, and then we have the planets, and we're still thinking about why, how you identify some of the stars as planets. And then you have the outer sphere, which contains all of the stars, and it rotates once a day entirely around the Earth. And that was a kind of scientific uh, uh, step forward. It accounted for that observation that the stars are rotating around the Earth, um, uh, seemingly. Um, and outside of that was God. So that's another staggeringly different thing that the medievals thought when they looked up at the sky. They didn't see a sky full of um, uh, stars, which we know to be burning, uh, like our sun, uh, a furnace, of uh, a huge furnace of, um, of nuclear energy. They thought they were looking at the gates of heaven, the walls of heaven, really. It's decorated with stars. And if they could, oh, planets, planets, okay. So how do you tell the difference between a star and a planet? I'll tell you at this slide and we'll come back to the question I was rambling towards. Planets don't move in perfect circles. They also don't twinkle and you can, and you can work out why or, or find out why they don't twinkle. But the key, key property of planets for our purpose is that they don't move in per perfect circles. They wander across the sky through the um, zodiac constellations. And this is how astrology, um, this is what astrology does, tracks their motion. And not only do they wander in, in these kind of curvy wanderings, but they sometimes reverse and, and go backwards. Instead of going from east to west, they go west to east, and then they go east to west again. So they have this rather peculiar motion. So remember that we um, accounted for the... Uh, stars um, on a crystal sphere, how do you count for the, um, the planets? Well, in the ancient world, you pinned the uh, planets to gods and gods could do what they like. They could roam the heavens, do what they like. So it wasn't really a problem in counting for the uh, erratic motion of the planets. The gods were erratic, unpredictable, and um, 
uh, there wasn't a problem with that. Of course, then once you try to uh, stick them onto crystal spheres, then you do have a problem with accounting for that erratic motion and the twists and turns. But the thing I want to get across to you, as I said, was that when the medievals looked at the sky, they were, didn't think they were looking at, at a universe. They thought they were looking at the, at the walls of heaven decorated with stars. And God was sending his messages to mortals by moving the stars and the planets. And those were messages to, uh, to us mortals. And if um, a medieval could, as in this illustration, climb up to um, the starry sphere and pull it open or thrust their head through the starry sphere, they would look into heaven. So it's a very different view of the world and the universe and also theology, because theology wasn't some, the gods weren't in some kind of different place, a heaven in a sphere, um, a place completely separated from the world. They were up there in the sky. There were other supernatural beings, the devil and his, um, uh, and his demons below the earth. There was only one sphere. So they expected it to be accounted for by a single set of laws. And one of the people who really had made the most impact on turning theology in a science was uh, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, the Italian um, theologian, who did a lot to in reintroduce Aristotle into Western philosophy. Aristotle and the other Greek philosophers famously been lost and then rediscovered by the, um, or coinciding with the Crusades. And when, Arist when Aquinas discovered Aristotle, he found Aristotle's science and he was completely bowled over by it. And he thought, this is the way that I can turn theology into a science by, for example, providing five proofs of God. I'm going to those, uh, briefly into those in a moment. But really, his mission was to fuse theology and science. So science would become the kind of um, uh, the kind of uh, system that would include both co gods, but also the scientific stuff around us, explaining the motion of the stars and the planets, but also the motion of the stuff around us. There was only one science. So that's what William of Ockham went to Oxford to study. Um, and um, so, yes, so one of the ways that uh, Aquinas um, tried to convince uh, the world that uh, uh, theology was a science and succeeded and uh, pretty well, was his five proofs of God. So they were based largely on Aristotle's philosophy, for example, and on Aristotle's science. So Aristotle said that everything that moves is moved by another. Aquinas said, well, if you take that backwards in time, you've got to have a first mover, who's obviously God. Aristotle said that everything has a number of causes, including a first cause. And the first cause, again, it's something located in time. So if you go backwards, you've got to, um, um, you've got to have a first cause. Um, and there was another argument, contingency, and the argument from degree, which we won't go into. But the other important argument that is in, uh, extremely important for science was the teleological argument. Aristotle also claimed that everything in the world had a purpose. So, for example, the purpose of acorns was to feed pigs. The purpose of pigs was to feed humans. And some philosophers even argued that the purpose of life for pigs was to keep the meat fresh. So everything had a purpose. And all of those purposes eventually led to God. So within these five ways, the five ways of proving that God exists, that Aquinas, that Aquinas had come up with, at least two of them were paths to God. Three of them really were paths to God. The first mover, if you follow move, movements backwards, you find God. The first cause, if you follow them backwards, you find God. The teleo teleological argument, if you find the final cause of everything, the telos, the final cause, then you find God. So for every object in the world, it had a teleological connection, it had a theological connection. So if we consider uh, teleology, for example, Every object, every animal and plant had a purpose in the world that God had designed for mankind and for mankind. The purpose of mankind, of course, was to worship God. So that was the final purpose of humanity in the world, to worship God. The purpose of lions was to provide a, a, an example of nobility. 
And the purpose of foxes was to provide a, a contrary example of slyness and, uh, and uh, uh, dishonesty. And the purpose of pelicans um, was rather peculiar. They were thought to pierce their breast with their beak in order to feed their chicks. And this was meant to be an example of Christ's suffering. So the purpose of pelicans in this world was to give us an example of Christ's suffering. So for the medievals, the world was saturated with theology. It was everywhere. And this is what William of Ockham came into. Oh, and another, another hugely important aspect of Aristotle's philosophy that was imported into the medievals uh, philosophy was universals. And this goes to the idea that go, uh, or a problem that goes back to say Plato. Um, and um, Plato was concerned about how we identify, for example, round objects like the ring you see here as being round. None of them are perfectly round. They're all different sizes, but we still recognize them as being round. How do we identify boxes as being boxes, cherries as being cherries when they're come in so many, at least for boxes, they come in so many shapes and sizes. And, um, and we still identify them. Plato came up with the idea that every object is made up of forms. And these were kind of invisible essences of objects. So a ring, for example, would be made up of a number of different forms. Um, the form of circularity, the form of gold, uh, a box would have the form of uh, wood, the form of a rectangle. A cherry would have the form of a circle, the form of tunus, the form of um, a redness, and uh, the form of sweetness. By the time this got imported into the medieval world, they became Aristotle's universals. And this was what most of the, scho of the scholast scholastics, as they were called, the people who, who studied the um, science in the um, medieval world, and theologians, um, they studied, they dissected objects into their universals. And this was a lot of what they did, which they considered to be part of the science of theology, dissecting objects and trying to work out what objects are really made of in terms of their forms. And again, that led to God because the universals were thought to be ideas in God's mind. So again, this is the unity of the of the of the real world around us and the theological world. It was all one and it all led to God. So back to William. So he studied theology. He didn't complete his degree. And that was because he was accused of heresy. We'll find out why. Summoned to Avignon to answer charges before the Pope. Uh, his trial um, took two years, but never was never completed because he got involved in another conflict, uh, this time between the Pope and the Franciscans on the holiness of poverty. Not time to go into that today, but it is very interesting. He ended up accusing the Pope of being a heretic, which caused him and his fellow Franciscans to flee Avignon, chased by a posse of soldiers, and escape to the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor. So he has an interesting story, should be much better known than he is. He turns up in um, Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose, or at least he's mentioned um, in, uh, in, the, in his great novel, um, and uh, Robert of, um, William of Baskerville is vaguely based on William of Ockham. But apart from that, people really don't know much about this extraordinary character. So what did he do first with Aquinas' proofs of God? He disproved them all. He, for example, pointed out that um, um, the unmoved mover argument doesn't provide a God because there could be, there doesn't need to be a single first mover. There could be 10, 100, 1,000, a trillion first movers. So none of those leads to a deity necessarily. Similar, uh, the first cause argument, he pointed out that um, um, in the Christian world at the time, there were objects that didn't have causes. For example, God didn't have a cause. Uh, free will didn't have a cause. We, we, we just mentioned about free will being discussed in the medieval world. Free will is, was considered to be free in the sense that it didn't have a cause. And that's important because people were sent to heaven or hell, so it was thought on the basis of the actions of their free will. So if free will didn't have a cause, why does everything need a cause? So um, uh, William of Ockham dismissed uh, causes, as said they just didn't exist. Um, similarly, he, he, I won't go through them all, but he dismissed all of them, including the teleological argument. So William of Ockham 
dismissed uh, the teleological argument that everything has a cause. I'll just, um, you, I'll let you read the whole slide if you like, um, but I will just read the last couple of lines. You might ask, why does the fire heat the wood rather than cool it? I reply that such is its nature. Now a natural agent is determined by its nature, not by an end. So although William of Ockham accepted that things like houses may have a purpose, he didn't accept that objects in the world really have a purpose. And so he removed, he used the, his razor, if you like, to eliminate teleology and say there were no causes. There were no final causes, there were no first causes. Um, uh, there's just how things happen in the world. So um, add on to universals. Remember these were these invisible essences of objects. Um, and uh, William of Ockham argued, for example, if we look at, um, at the final, the cherries here, there was the universal of two-ness. Um, William of Ockham used the argument, well, if you have two chairs in a room and a third chair in an adjacent room, and then uh, somehow the universal of two-ness would have to be converted to the universal of three-ness if you knock down the wall between the two rooms. And that just didn't make sense. So he, um, he argued that uh, uh, universals themselves uh, do not exist at all, that all there are are objects. So he removed universals from um, the, um, anything existing. There are only ideas in the mind. And that left what for science? It left the study of real objects. So instead of dissecting objects into their uh, universals of two-ness and three-ness and redness and sweetness, you just studied the object, and that became modern science. Also, it effectively cut the link between study of the world and God. There was no link through teleology. There was no link through the first cause. There was no link through universals. So William went on to say that the article of Christian faith should be accepted as such. He was a Franciscan friar. As far as we know, he remained devout throughout his life. They cannot be proved by reason, nor can they be made the basis of knowledge. Science and theology are essentially different and must not be confused. As far as I know, and um, if anyone can um, uh, point out any, anyone who said anything like this earlier, I would be interested to hear. As far as I know, William of Ockham is the first person in the history of the world to clearly separate science from theology and religion. And um, let me know if I'm wrong, but uh, I've not encountered anyone so far. So that was extraordinarily important, I think. In this little corner, um, this is a, an ancient map of the world. You can see Anglia in the bottom left-hand corner uh, where William of Ockham was, but he had an influence throughout Europe. And his influence, I think, was one of the stimuli that led to the growth of science in the West. So in the medieval world, Europe was just a small part of the world and really the center was in, in the East. That has changed and it changed because of science. And I think William of Ockham played an unappreciated role in that. So the role of Ockham's razor in science. So we've already seen that the motion of the um, stars gave rise, rise to the idea that they were carried on spheres, not only the uh, celestial sphere, which uh, carries the stars, but the planets. That created a problem, of course, because of the erratic motion. If you remember, they um, move erratically across the sky and they even twist and turn. The astronomer to attempt to make sense of that, at least provide a geometric representation, was the last great astronomer of antiquity, Claudius Ptolemy. And he came up with um, the Ptolemaic um, astronomy system. And basically it was a geometrical system for predicting the motion of the heavens. It has the earth in the center, the geocentric system. And then the planets are those, and uh, the planets, the moon and the, and the sun are the rings around uh, the center and the erratic motion of the planets are those whirly bits in the, in the diagram. So, but from this, um, 
Uh, he could predict very accurately the motion of the planets. And the uh, Ptolemy system was used right through to the Middle Ages. Um, uh, people um, like Columbus used the Ptolemaic system to predict the motion of the, of the stars. So um, it was an extraordinarily successful system, despite being wrong, which is interesting. So being um, good at making predictions doesn't necessarily mean you're right. Uh, wrong because, of course, it's geocentric rather than heliocentric. Now, William of Ockham made a statement, I think is, is in 1323, there is, is pretty um, uh, astounding. It appears to me that the matter in the heavens is of the same kind as the matter down below. And this is because, using his razor, plurality should never be posited beyond necessity. He's saying that it's much easier, much more, makes much more sense to say that the stuff in the, in the sky is the same as the stuff down below and made up of rocks and stones, I guess, like, uh, like everything else. Now, what was his influence? So he was in, um, he was around in 13, uh, he, he said that statement I just read out around about 13, or wrote that statement around about 1323. He had an influence his, uh, that spread right across um, Europe. It became known as the um, uh, Via Moderna, the new way, as opposed to the old scholastic way. Uh, of looking for simple solutions, getting rid of universals and other um, uh, elements of metaphysics from philosophy, the movement that I ultimately, I think, became science. For example, one of the Occamist scholars in Paris, um, who um, coincided with William of Ockham and, and picked up a lot of his ideas, was someone called uh, Jean Buridan. And he um, he said this, just as it's better to save the appearance through fewer causes than many, essentially Occam's razor, it is better to say that the Earth, which is very small, is moved most rapidly in the highest sphere, the one carrying the stars, is at rest. In other words, as far as I can see, he's the first person to propose that the stars are still and the Earth is spinning on the basis of simplicity. That was the only grounds. He's saying that this makes more sense because it's simple. Now, uh, and that was in 1340, well before Copernicus, who took up the idea, of course. And Copernicus's um, motivation for trying to find a better solution in the heavens was that he found the Ptolemaic system, which I illustrated earlier, as rather gross and monstrous, he called it. And he couldn't believe that the heaven was so ugly, if you like, made up of such a complex uh, collection of motions. Uh, so when he studied, um, when he went to try to uh, make sense of it in a better way, he said, after I addressed myself to this very difficult and almost insoluble problem, so the, the suggestion at length came to me how it could be solved with fewer and much simpler constructions that, than were formerly used. So again, Copernicus's motivation, I believe, and there's evidence for this. Motivate, his motivation was inspired by the Via Moderna that had been founded by William of Ockham's work, taken forward by Jean Buridan and other philosophers in the medieval world to influence the uh, great scientists of the um, Renaissance and the, um, and the Enlightenment, um, such as Copernicus. So he um, famously found a much simpler solution to all those wiggles in the heavens. And that was by putting the sun at the center uh, rather than the earth. Um, and to show how much simpler it is, of course, this is um, a program you can do online is to model the uh, solar system. Well, actually, this is just one planet. And uh, Venus modeled for, with um, the sun at the center. And as you can see, it makes sense, a nice simple system and then modeled with the earth at the center on the right. And you can see how much more complex it is. And essentially the medievals were trying to make sense of what was going on in the right. Whereas Copernicus says, look, it makes much more sense if we do this and have this simple system with the sun rather than the earth at the center. And then you can do science, you can work out laws. And this is of course what Johannes Kepler did. Johannes Kepler, again, he was inspired by simplicity. Nature loves simplicity and unity, and often a single cause will produce many effects. Now, in fact, this the, uh, model of Copernicus 
had a problem. Um, it looks like it's a perfect circle, but it's not. It's got little wiggles in it. And that was because Copernicus insisted that the circles had to be, uh, circles he put in the heavens had to be perfect circles because only they could fit on the spheres, the crystal spheres that they, he still believed were in the heavens. Kepler famously bent those circles into ellipses. Um, and again, the only, um, uh, uh, actually not the only, his motivation for doing this was simplicity, but he also discovered that the system that he then uh, came up with, the um, heliocentric system with elliptical orbits, um, was much more accurate in making predictions in the heavens. I got rid of the crystal. The crystals, um, once you have ellipses, they won't fit on the surface of spheres anymore. So the crystal had to go. So he removed the crystal from the heavens. But he also came up with laws. And laws are extremely important in science because they provide the simplest expression of complex systems, such as the solar system. What Kepler discovered is that he could account for the motion of the, all of the planets that he could see, it's fewer than those that we can see today, but um, um, he could account for all of those motions with just three laws. And I won't go into, into them, but there they are in front of you. Um, and those accounted for all of the motions in the, in the, uh, in the heavens, uh, including the motion of even comets, you could um, model with his laws. So uh, nation lo uh, nature loves simplicity and unity, and often a single cause will produce many effects. So again, he was his motivation was to try to find a simpler way of accounting for the world. But his laws only applied in the heavens. The person who found laws to work on Earth was, of course, Galileo. He discovered the universal acceleration under gravity in contrast to what Aristotle had proposed and Galileo, Galilean relativity. So that, I think, was his greatest contribution. Previous to earlier than Galileo, laws were searched for in the heavens, like uh, uh, the Ptolemaic system and um, uh, Kepler's uh, laws. But the world, the on, the terrestrial world looked like it was too messy to be governed by laws. But Galileo, by performing very careful experiments, showed that he could find laws also in the terrestrial world. And of course, that was taken forward by Isaac Newton, who found his three laws of motion and his universal gravitational law that applied both in the heavens and on Earth. So this was the first real um, unification of the world, the universe, finding a single set of laws that accounted for both heaven and earth. And that was extraordinarily um, powerful unification. And of course, unifications are simplifications. Instead of two sets of laws, you have a single set of laws, a single law. And again, Newton was inspired by simplicity. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. So, uh, and this is just slide is just to remind me to say that um, uh, so the great uh, contribution of Newton was to find that the, uh, find that the sky and the uh, terrestrial world were governed by a single set of laws. But I also wanted to use Newton's law to also point out that laws are the simplest expression of complicate of a complicated world. For example, if we take one of his law. Uh, laws. His third law, um, that every action is an equal and opposite reaction, illustrated here by this man pushing a box. Well, actually, that's not, that is the simplest law, but there are an infinite number of more complex laws that could account for the same observation, as well as um, every action and reaction, every action, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. You could have, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. A reaction plus a demon who's also pushing on the other side. Or you maybe have two demons or three demons or four or five demons. You can have as many as you like. And the law would still account for every observation that we see. But what Newton did and what all science does is search for the simplest expression, get rid of the demons and find the simplest laws. And this is what science does. So, and again, truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in the 
multiplicity confusion of things. And uh, one of uh, Newton's colleagues, Robert Boyle, discovered the, the first gas law, um, pressure uh, Boyle's law, pressure times volume to diff, um, is always is equal to a constant. So if you take a, a volume of air and you compress it, you make the volume smaller, so the pressure goes up. So get what this illustrates is once you have laws, simple laws that you can make predictions from, then you can build technologies. Does that uh, diagram um, there um, um, remind you of anything? It's how um, uh, steam engines work and the internal combustion engines work. And they work because they obey the gas laws and other laws, of, of course, that uh, Boyle and others discovered. And this is what laws allow you to do because they give you a simple expression of um, many different phenomena. They allow you to make predictions of how it works. And if you can make predictions of how things work, then you can work out how to harness the work at uh, the energy of steam, for example, to power the industrial revolution. So these finding these simple laws wasn't just uh, an exercise in philosophy. It drive, drove technologies. Without the simple laws, we wouldn't have technologies. And again, this is um, uh, inspired by simplicity. Uh, and the words of Robert Boyle, a great part of the work of the true philosophers has been to reduce the true principles of things to the smallest number they can without making them insufficient. So all of the great scientists of the Enlightenment, of the age of um, uh, scientific revolution, were all inspired by um, simplicity. And then going further, we've all already said that um, um, Newton unified the uh, laws in the heavens with the laws in the terrestrial world. Um, statistical mechanics unified the microscopic world with Newton's laws by finding uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, um, Maxwell and Gibbs applied um, Newton's laws essentially in the terrestrial world to account for the, to provide us with the laws and uh, science of thermodynamics, which drives those steam trains. So again, it's a unification. Instead of having another law that's operating in the microscopic world, it was the same laws. And other, another great unification, of course, space and time and the universe and the unification of gravity and acceleration provided by Einstein and his uh, um, special and general relativity. And again, Einstein was inspired by, by simplicity. Nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. Natural selection um, unified all of biology into a single explanation of natural selection. And uh, as Alfred Russell Wallace, one of the co-discoverers of, um, of the law of natural uh, selection, uh, said the theory itself is exceedingly simple and the facts on which it rests come under a few simple and easily un understood uh, classes. So again, now in biology, um, uh, simplifications um, uh, took place in which instead of um, a million separate creations, which was the only explanation for biology prior to natural selection, you had a single origin of life and diversification by uh, natural selection and speciation. So that was a huge, huge simplification in the natural world. And um, where we're gonna go to now is towards particle physics and uh, very briefly, and that's to look at, at symmetry and the role of symmetry as a simplification. And it isn't immediately obvious that symmetry involves a simplification, but if we look at this butterfly, you might think that you know what the other half of this butterfly is, but in fact you don't because it's not symmetrical. But if you look at another butterfly, if you know half of the butterfly, you also know the other half. So if you compare the two, this is not symmetrical. It contains more information. If you see one half, you can't predict the other. You don't have predictability across the halves. With a symmetrical butterfly, if you see half of it, you see the whole of it. So this is simpler. Symmetry gives you simplicity. And of course, symmetry is fundamental to particle physics. Um, I mean, Notha 
um, uh, discovered uh, that this was uh, that the laws of physics could be predicted through principles of simplicity. Those were picked up by particle physics and particle physicists in the 20th century, and they're fundamental to uh, particle physics and help to, for example, predict the Higgs boson. So simplicity is uh, remains crucial to um, physics and indeed all of science. Okay, now I want to pause for a moment and ask the question, how Occam's razor works? So there are two aspects to it. One of it, one part of it is, um, well, actually there are many Occam's razors and um, um, uh, Sober wrote a book recently about Occam's razors and, um, uh, and he pointed out there are many forms of Occam's razor, many ways in which you can look for simple solutions. But the one I want to highlight today is in Bayesian inference. And Bayesian inference goes to Thomas Bayes, of course, and his famous equation. And in Bayesian inference, you uh, have a model and you update the model based essentially on the likelihood. And the likelihood um, is what you use to analyze the data. And it's the probability of the data given the model. Now, that sounds a little bit complicated. It actually is very easy. And I'm going to illustrate it by imagining I have two dice in my hands. In my left hand, I have a normal six-sided dice. And in my right hand, I have a 60-sided dice, as you can see uh, on the uh, slide. Now, secretly, I throw one of the dice. Now, you'd think, well, two hands, two, I need two dice. I throw one of the dice. The prior should be that it's a 50% chance that I'm uh, throwing the uh, six-sided dice or the 60-sided dice. Now, I tell you I've thrown, say, 29. And I ask you to guess, what dice have I thrown? It's obvious, I've thrown the 60-sided dice. That's the only one compatible with the data. So you have to have a complex model. Um, people often attack Occam's razor by saying, well, the world isn't, isn't simple, it's complicated. That isn't what this form of Occam's razor is about, at least. It doesn't care about how complex the world is. It's asked you to reason about the world using Occam's razor and pick the simplest solution. In this case, it's a 60-sided dice, okay? Now I throw a five. Okay, so again, I take both uh, dice in my hands, throw one of them, and I throw a five. Now I ask you to guess, which dice have I thrown? It's not so easy now, is it? Taking the prior, I could have thrown the, either dice by a 50-50 chance. It could be either dice, but is it, are both equally likely? Hopefully you've come to the conclusion, no, they're not equally likely, because a six-sided dice can the throws are five every six throws approximately. Whereas a 60 sided dice throws a five only one out of 60 throws. So the likelihood of the data given the model, the likelihood of both models, a six sided dice or a 60 sided dice is very different. The likelihood of the six sided dice is one in six for throwing the five and the likelihood of the 60 sided dice is one in 60. So when you plug those values into the Bayesian equation, you get that it's tenfold more likely that I've thrown the six-sided dice, even though the prior on it, the prior probability was 50%. Now I've thrown a five, it's now 10 times more likely than the six-sided dice. It could still be the 60-sided dice, of course, but it's less likely. If I threw them again and I got a five, um, uh, or a four or a three, then you'd, it would make the 60-sided dice less and less probable. But at the moment, it just has tenfold less probable. But this is how Occam's razor works. Complex models have many different uh, facets to them, and they make looser predictions. Instead of just a number between one and six, the 60-sided dice can come up with a number between one and 60. Similarly, the Ptolemaic system, because it was so complex, it could account for pretty much any motion in the heavens. Once you had a heliocentric system with only um, uh, the planets that you see, the five, uh, five planets that they saw in, in the sky, and you had simple circles or ellipses, it was a much simpler system. And because it fitted the data, the chances of that fitting the data were much, that it gives you a much higher likelihood because the number of parameters in the system are much lower. 
than in the Ptolemaic system on the right. So the likelihood of, of having fitted the data for the um, heliocentric system uh, being true is much higher than the Ptolemaic system, even though both can fit the data. So this is how Occam's razor works. It looks at the likelihood of the data given the model. Okay, so that's how Occam's razor works. And remember, this Occam's razor is a um, rule of inference. It's not an, an ontological, ontological claim about the world. It doesn't say that entities are simple. It says that when you reason about them, choose the models that have the smallest number of entities. And um, entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. So that's one reason why Occam's razor works because it allows, it chooses, it, um, um, it prefers simple models and simple models have a higher probability of being the source of your data if they fit the data. And this is true for not only astronomy, it's true for um, the uh, data of uh, looking at um, motion in uh, Newtonian laws, it's true for uh, biology, it's true for everything. That if you find a simple model that fits your data and a more complex model that also fits your data, your simple model is more likely on the basis of Bayesian inference. So that is a really important part of Occam's razor in this form, it's an argument about reason, not about how complex the world is. We know there are now, for example, eight or nine planets out there, not one, because we know the data tells us there's more to be seen. But there is another form of Occam's razor and it is an ontological, it's about what exists in the world. And it is a claim that the world is simple. And Einstein was convinced by this. He was um, um, thought that the world, the universe was built on simple laws, such as his uh, equals mc squared, the Schrodinger equation, very uh, simple uh, equation. And um, other people have said, other scientists have um, also made statements that suggest that the universe is made up of simple parts. This is um, um, Neil Turek, uh, the cosmologist, who said that the universe has turned out to be stunningly simple. It's simpler than any of our models can explain. What he meant there was actually the early universe. This is the cosmic microwave background, of course. And he was saying that the universe started from a very, very simple beginning. That's so simple that it's hard for us to account for how it turned into the complex object that it is today. So <laughs> the other question um, I want to come to at this point is that um, um, what is science? What is science? And um, I've got a few minutes more. Uh, what is science? So this is what uh, Wiki says about what science is, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the world. That's, yeah, that's what science is really. It also is what cookery is. That's what cooks do. It's what plumbers do. It's what carpenters do. It's what uh, gardeners do. It doesn't really tell you anything about what science does because it's pretty much what every, how we deal with everything in the world. We systemize it. We make predictions about what's going to taste nice. And we test them by asking our guests to tell us whether it was nice or not. So it's not peculiar to science, making predictions and experiments. None of those are peculiar to science. For example, experiment, the alchemists were very keen on experiment and they didn't get anywhere. So experiments um, aren't uh, peculiar to science. Gardner will experiment with trying out different pl plants in their garden. So experiment is universal. It's not peculiar to science. Um, Mathematics often thought, okay, well, that's science. Actually, astrologers use mathematics a lot. Economists, everyone, everyone uses mathematics. Another one, which I don't think I've got a slide for, but I'll point out falsifiability. This is Karl Popper's um, um, criterion for science. It doesn't work because anyone who's who a practicing scientist knows that it's hard, it's just as hard to falsify a hypothesis than to prove one. I mean, I many a time look at the results of my experiment and I see that they don't agree with what I, um, the, my theory, I don't immediately say it's false. I kind of think of an excuse why I could account for it. And this is what scientists do all the time. 
takes a lot to disprove a theory. And anyway, um, disprovability is also not peculiar to science. It's found in, in many other, uh, in law, for example, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very important. And this is what I would say science is. This is ultimately all sciences. Science is only about finding the simple solutions, a systematic enterprise that uses logic, mathematics, and experiment to identify the simplest models of the world that provide the most accurate and general predictions. If you tell me anything in science that goes outside of that and any other field of thought, any other philosophical system, any other way of making reasons, making sense of the world, that uses the same principle, then let me know. Because as far as I can see, this science is the only way of making sense of the world that sticks to Watkins razor. It always accepts only the simplest solutions. Actually, um, I won't uh, uh, read that one out. But I also want to go back to um, looking at something and how simple is our world. This is um, uh, the law of least action. And, um, and it tells us that, um, uh, as Jenny Coppersmith said, we live in a lazy universe, that instead of complicated motions, say when an arrow is fire, fired at a, at a target, it takes a very simple path rather than a complex path. So we do seem to have um, evidence that the world, that the universe may be uh, simpler than we think it is. And as I said, um, uh, the particle physics model is also quite simple, but is it, is it really all that simple? For example, neutrinos, why are they, why are they there? Because millions, trillions of them are passing through your body this second, trillions of neutrinos. Aren't they dispensable? Aren't they entities beyond necessity? In fact, they're not because the sun couldn't shine without them. It's to do with something to do with the symmetry of uh, nuclear fission, but without neutrinos, the sun couldn't shine. So we wouldn't be here without neutrinos. So neutrinos aren't entities beyond necessity. Dark matter, is that an entity beyond necessity? Uh, in fact, it isn't because dark matter seems to be involved in the early universe when it was needed to coalesce the stars and planets or into, uh, or Co coalesce the matter into making stars and planets. So it does seem to be, this is really um, a claim that I think is, is a reasonable claim that actually the universe may be about as simple as it could be in order to generate us. This is nearly the last thing I'm going to say that actually the ontological claim may have some substance that there may be some uh, truth in the idea that the universe is about as simple as it could be. And in, the, in my book, I go into a possible reason for that. Lastly, I want to leave you, leave you with a kind of pocket Occam's razor. I think Occam's razor is extraordinarily important in the history of science. Simplicity is embedded in science and scientists have kind of forgotten it because it's become part of their, part of their mindset and they don't think, realize they use it when they use it all the time. But, it's not used in many aspects of, of life and fake news, pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, etc., are exploding the world into complexities that uh, we never imagined before, where individual chat rooms have their own philosophies and their own ideas about uh, our objects and the way the world works. So here is a simple way, a simple Occam's razor. The difficulty often with Occam's razor is to find out which is the simplest model. There's an easy way of giving you a kind of um, um, rule of thumb is choose the explanation, the model, the theory that has the fewest words. If you can say it's simple, simply, then it is simple. If it's a complicated model, theory, explanation, it's gonna take more words. So simply count the number of words and choose the simplest um, simplest explanation for uh, for a phenomena such as, or for, um, uh, for example, COVID-19. You can say that COVID-19 is a virus that came from a bat or a similar animal and um, transmitted to a human, possibly through a lab, who knows? But that's a simple explanation. Or you can take a more complex explanation that it's a conspiracy that, uh, 
was headed by um, Bill Gates and uh, many other um, uh, leading and very wealthy people who want to control the world by injecting us with um, microchips that they're inserting into vaccines involving doctors, and they released the COVID-19 in order to persuade us to take vaccines. That takes a lot of words. But, you know, if they use enough words, they can account for everything. But the only, the only argument against all of this, the only ground that we can stand on, really isn't logic in terms of saying they're wrong, because they'll always, everything you throw at them, they'll always have an explanation for it. It's that their explanations are so complex that, on the Bayesian Occam's razor, the likelihood of them being true is tiny. Because if you have all of these factors into your, into your model of the world, then almost anything can be accounted for. So that's how to use Occam's razor in your life. Um, use Occam's pocket razor to find the simplest solution to the problems of life. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.